In this lesson, we are going to look at um, how humans use the environment and um, what we can do to preserve the environment. So uh, if you look at your uh, notes, we're looking at how do humans affect the ecosystem or how they affect ecosystems. The first thing you have to understand is that the population problem is a major issue for ecosystems. We mentioned this at the end of talking about populations. The greater the Earth's population, the more we're going to put pressure on the resources on the planet. Um, and so all of these issues that I'm about to discuss get way more complicated and way worse when you start to deal with overcrowding and overpopulated Earth. Let's start with um, the greenhouse effect, okay? So that's what you're seeing here. The greenhouse effect, first of all, is not negative, okay? Uh, the greenhouse effect makes life on the planet a possibility. Here's how. The sunlight that travels through space hits the planet and our atmosphere traps a good deal of it in. So some of the sunlight comes in and it gets trapped and it bounces around inside of the atmosphere. Um, that allows the atmosphere to stay relatively warm and it allows the temperature of the planet to stay warm. And if we didn't have an atmosphere, what would happen is when the sun was shining on us, we would burn up because there would be all of the solar radiation hitting us. And notice the atmosphere blocks some of the radiation, right? Some of it bounces off. Um, but also at night, we would freeze to death um, because there would be nothing holding heat in around us. So the atmosphere actually helps us uh, to make this greenhouse effect and make life on Earth possible. The problem with the greenhouse effect is that the greenhouse effect has kind of run away lately, and this is because of anthropogenic carbon, in other words, uh, carbon that's been generated by human beings. Um, and no matter what anybody tells you, the, all the science out there points to the fact that humans are putting way more carbon in the atmosphere than we should be putting into the atmosphere and that that seems to be increasing the temperature on the planet. So that's the deal with the greenhouse effect. So it's good until it gets to be too much, until we have too much greenhouse effect and then um, we start to have problems with the temperature of the earth rising. And that has a whole bevy of other concerns that goes along with it that we're not going to get into here, but you would talk about it in environmental science or in earth science class. Now, what I want you to understand is that this is not, uh, whoops, here we go, this is not ozone. Okay, this is not, this does not have anything to do with the hole in the ozone layer. The hole in the ozone layer is a separate issue. It has nothing to do with the greenhouse effect um, in that, you know, the hole in the ozone layer does not cause the greenhouse effect. The hole in the ozone layer was caused by something called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. Um, and these are propellants that were present in um, a lot of cleaning supplies and hairsprays and room air fresheners and things like that. And those CFCs would rise into the atmosphere and interact with ozone. And the ozone layer is just kind of within the atmosphere. It was just this thin layer. It is just this thin layer. These CFCs would interact with the ozone and start munching a hole in it. Um, and that ozone was protecting us from some harmful UV radiation. And so really the issue with the hole in the ozone layer, it has a lot more to do with the fact that we're being exposed to dangerous radiation and animals are being exposed to dangerous radiation as a result of that hole. That does not cause the greenhouse effect. I cannot stress enough that does not cause the greenhouse effect. Okay, two separate issues. All right, the next issue is acid rain formation. Acid rain is also a human um, phenomenon. This is something that we do um, to the environment. And what you can see, this is a little diagram showing you what happens with acid rain. Human activities from factories put sulfates, NOx, other chemicals into the environment. These are sulfur compounds and nitrogen compounds that in the atmosphere combine with water um, and with sunlight turn into acids that rain down on the land. Now that does not mean that if, it's, if there's acid rain you're going to melt your face off if you step outside. 
What it does mean, though, is that that rain starts to run off into the water supply and can damage the gills of fish and other wildlife that lives in the water. In the mountains of North Carolina, there's terrible problems with acid rain um, because it damages plant roots, and so a lot of our forests are being very badly damaged by acid rain. We're talking about a mild drop in pH, not a huge drop in pH. And it's not so much that it's dangerous for you, but the things that are out in the acid rain constantly and can't get away from it um, have issues. So again, this is a human-induced problem. And the way that we've combated this is by installing in these smokestacks something called a scrubber, which is a filter that filters out the SO2 and the NOx so that they're not in the emissions from the factory. All right, we're going to skip down to invading species uh, very quickly. Um, invading species are species that are also called introduced species. These are non-native species, okay? So things that are brought into an ecosystem that weren't there originally. What that means is they didn't evolve there, and the other things that live in that area didn't evolve with it. So what happens is these invaders tend to outcompete um, the native species. There are no native uh, predators to the area, to the, the invading species. Um, and so they do really well in that ecosystem, and as a result, they outcompete the native species. The native species tends to die off, and then you're left with um, the non-native species or the invading species. A prime example of this is kudzu, and again, there's a video clip uh, in Edmodo and Blackboard that you are supposed to be watching as part of an activity. Um, that will describe this. This is a Burmese python. Uh, a lot of people like these Burmese pythons as pets when they're small, but then, you know, this can be an eight foot long snake in your house. And once that snake gets to be eight feet long and you're feeding it a rabbit once a month, um, it gets expensive and difficult to maintain. And so a lot of people started releasing these Burmese pythons into the Florida Everg Everglades. Um, and again, they're causing problems there. So there's some issues there with invading species. Um, before we just go on from there, understand that all of these things, these human activities, can lead to habitat destruction. And then every time you destroy habitat, you destroy the ability for other organisms to survive um, because they need those habitats. Okay, so that's an issue. Let's go on and talk about resources now. You have three types of resources in ecosystems you've got the renewables you've got the non-renewables and you've got the recyclables All right. Uh, so resources like water, carbon, nitrogen, etc. are all cycling resources and those cycle naturally through the environment and therefore we call them renewable resources okay so those are renewable renewable resources or any resources can be biotic or abiotic by the way um, there are also the non-renewable resources, and the re non-renewable resources are things like the fossil fuels like coal and gas um, and oil. Those actually do renew and they do cycle naturally in the environment. Unfortunately, they take tens of thousands of years to cycle. So when we say they don't cycle naturally, what we mean is they don't cycle during our lifetime. So once we use them up, they're gone, okay, and we won't, we won't ever see them back in our lifetime. Recyclable resources are resources that humans do the cycling on. So if they don't cycle naturally through ecosystems, but humans can reprocess and reclaim them and reuse them, we call those recyclable resources. All right, so what can humans do? Okay, we've talked about bad things that humans do to the ecosystems. Um, what humans can do is something called sustainable practices. And sustainable practices are ways that we can use the ecosystem um, indefinitely. In other words, it's not going to be hard on the environment. Here's an example of a sustainable farming practice that you see here, contour planting. So if a farmer has a hilly farm and plows up and down the hills, what happens is the uh, water washes down the hills and it takes the topsoil off with it. Um, so that's not sustainable, obviously. You, you need the topsoil to grow. So one example of a sustainable practice is to do contour plowing, uh, where you plow around the hill, and that's what you're seeing here. This farmer is plowed around um, the hills. So that's an example of a sustainable practice, and there's all kinds of them, from using natural predators for pest uh, reduction to crop rotation, stuff like that. Um, anything that can... Um, continue for years and years to come without damaging the ecosystem is called a sustainable practice. 
All right, one of the issues um, that comes up from non-sustainable practices in terms of farming is bioamplification, which is also called bioaccumulation or biological magnification. So it's got several names. But essentially, what you have to recognize is this. When you dump something into the water or dump something into an ecosystem, like a pesticide, here's uh, an example with DDT. There may be very little DDT in the water, if it, the water dilutes the DDT, to say 0.4 parts per million, okay? But the small fish that eat um, the plants in the water are taking up a lot, you know, they have, because of the energy depleting as you go up the food chain, they have to eat a lot of plants to get energy, so they don't get the 0.04 parts per million, they get 0.23 parts per million, okay? And again, the secondary consumer, the carnivore that eats these fish, have to eat a lot of them throughout their lifetime because they need the energy, and they get 2.07 parts per million. By the time you get to a top carnivore, notice they're taking a heavy load of this. That's what amplification or magnification means, right? It gets greater and greater and greater. So what's happening here, and here's another example that you can see, is while energy depletes as you go up food chains, um, the concentration of pesticides and nasty chemicals actually increases, and that's what this this arrow is showing. You start with a very narrow arrow and it gets very, very wide by the time you get to the top predator. Um, unfortunately, what happens uh, and what happened with DDT, the DDT example, is the top predator in that ecosystem is the osprey or the bald eagle. And um, this was um, when, when the bald eagles would get a heavy DDT load, they would produce a thin eggshell. And as a result, um, when they'd lay their eggs, the eggs would crack and the babies would die, and that was what was causing the bald eagle population uh, to, to dip back in the 70s and 80s. So um, since we've banned DDT, that's been less of a problem. Another farming issue is eutrophication. Eutrophication, something that sounds good but is actually not good for environments. Okay. Eutrophication literally means to nourish the water, okay? So nourishing sounds good, right? Nourishing, that's a good thing, right? But unfortunately what happens is you take, for example, fertilizers and you spread fertilizers on your lawn or on a crop and then it rains. And that rain washes the, some of that fertilizer into uh, storm sewers and things like that. Every time something goes into a drain, eventually some of that water is going to lead to the ocean. Okay, or if you have a farmer that's dumping um, fertilizer on their land, uh, some of it is going to wash off into the water somewhere, a pond, something like that. Okay, any of those things. Um, what we have in North Carolina is hog lagoons, so hog waste lagoons. So a hog farmer that has um, a lake of basically pig poo on their farm um, when we have hurricanes, those lagoons tend to flood, and then the flooding of that poop ends up in the water supply. And while poop is nasty, it's also got a lot of nutrients in it. It's also got a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in it. So the first thing is, you dump this fertilizer in the water, and the plants flourish, and the algae flourishes, okay? Um, so you get these algal blooms, and the algal blooms... Um, you know, the algae has a short lifespan, so it lives, it lives, and then it dies, okay? And when it dies, the bacteria in the water start to deplete the oxygen. So as this dead algae kind of sinks to the bottom, um, bacteria down here start to decay the, um, the uh, dead stuff, and that consumes all the oxygen from this bottom level of the water, and you end up with um, oxygen levels at a low point causing something called anoxia, okay, no, no water, or no oxygen, sorry. Um, and so what happens is the ecosystem um, ends up dying. You start to see fish kills, and we've seen this along the Noose River uh, in North Carolina. Um, you know, it's, it's a major problem, um, and so farmers have to be very careful about fertilizers that they spread, and we have to be very careful about fertilizers that we spread even on our lawns. So what this means is that we have to control several things if we want our ecosystems to continue. We've got to control population. 
We've got to have policies in place about soil and land use, and we have to have policies in place about how we treat our atmosphere. Um, all of those things are going to be important for our continued existence on the planet.